Today's date is the 4th of May 2021. My name is Shane Jackson and I am interviewing John Edmonds for the Memories Captured project. To start with, can you tell me how you got involved with blacksmithing? This is my life history, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm 67 this year, so I was born in the 1950s. And my father, when he came out of the Second World War, um, was a he, he became a clerk for uh, an animal feed firm in Andover. And the, f um, the, the, the mill manager retired um, in the early 60s. Uh, my father took on the mill manager's job and we moved we were living in a mill house, and we moved down the road into the uh, the main mill manager's house, which was on the site of the mill. In fact, the house was attached to the mill. Um, and this is um, um, a mill called Vitovis in Andover. It was on the River Anton. And it had been, um, it had been um, powered by um, a water turbine, um, so there were there were lots of things in that mill that when when we moved into the the mill house, um, I, I became interested in, and um, the mill workshop was right outside of our kitchen at the back of the house, and I, you know as a, a young lad, and what was I then um, five or six, um, I used to go and pester pester the guys in the workshop and um you know and and i was obviously taking an interest in what they were doing um and so there were some real characters working in this place um there was a chappy called joe hannon who was the um the vehicle mechanic and he used to look after the lorries and the the vans and um some of the mill equipment and there was a mill right uh, bill davidge his name was um, and these were sort of you know i suppose they must have been Old boys, probably in their 40s or 50s, you know, they'd done that sort of work all their life. They had been, um, um, I forget what they called them, um, 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 workers during the Second World War who had, um, you know, essential jobs so they didn't have to sort of sign up for anything. They didn't go and fight anywhere. So um, I hung out with them for, you know, quite a few years and probably annoyed them considerably as a young lad asking questions you know and i remember seeing um you know machining the you know they had a lathe in their workshop and you know i remember being in there and seeing them turn things and um, arc welding and gas welding you know so you know that was my introduction to um what well, i suppose at that point it was sort of mill writing and you know repair repair work for mill mill machines and equipment and you know and that sort of really that set the trend for me you know that was that was an interest that um captured my imagination and um i was a i was a model maker so um you know i worked in plastics airfix kits and um you know balsa wood and made things and these, the, the, you know, this, this, um, this, this life that I was leading, going to school as well, um, you know, sort of was 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 my main interest. You know, I didn't really sort of partake in sports or anything. I had my own workshop in the house where I used to go, and, you know, make and build things. So, you know, that was my sort of childhood, my childhood introduction to, you know, working in in metals specifically as well as you know, a bit of woodwork. And then when I was at school, um, because I was, you know, doing bits of metal work, um, I did woodwork. I did old level woodwork. <laughs> and when I came out of school, um, I went to um, Salisbury Technical College and did an engineering course, two-year engineering, which was a, a full-time ON, OND course. So by the time I'd left that in the early 70s, um, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to get my hands dirty. I suppose I didn't want to go on to university or polytech. Um, I did go and look at several courses, 
you know, at various various institutions. But no, I wanted to go and I wanted to go and you know work in the trade. So I came out of college, and my first job was with um, trailer manufacturers in Andover, Tasker's Trailers. Now, this was based in the old Waterloo Ironworks in Anna Valley. Um, and I didn't realize it at the time, but they were all part of the um, the agricultural um, scene from the late Victorian era. Um, you know, they, they, they built um, um, plows and um, they actually made steam engines there. Um, anyway, that job sort of didn't last very long. The, the company was taken over by the David Brown Group and it all sort of fell apart. So... I I was only there for about three months, and my manager um, pulled me into the office, you know, and I was a young sort of 19-year-old, and that was my first first introductory introduction to being made redundant. So um, I went off then and started working in various jobbing shops, as I'd like to sort of think of them, around the Salisbury and Andover area. Um, And in the early 70s, to the late 70s and the engineering trade you know if you were young and keen you know you could go and work in a place for sort of three or four months um learn some skills and then go and get another job somewhere else you know people were crying out for young keen lads to sort of you know get into the trade so i landed up sort of working for various people um either jobbing shops or um, shops where um you know they made specific products um there's one place in andover i work for where we made um cryogenic um <laughs> cryogenic things which is a bit interesting <laughs> um, you know um and 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 you know throughout the 70s um you know i met a lot of very skilled engineers and they became my mentors and they taught me things that you would never learn in a, an academic situation or, um, um, you know, anywhere else, but sort of on the job. And, you know, and some of these boys were sort of, you know, they, they've been doing it all their lives. And so, you know, my skill levels increased to probably a fairly high standard. Um, I was doing a lot of aerospace and production engineering work and yeah i mean i was at the top of the trade really you know as the trade was in those days so i did that for 20 years you know and i I got a bit bored with it you know working to other people's drawings and making things that you know would never see as a finished product and i i was beginning to get disillusioned with it um you know, I wanted to make things and see the final products. And because I'd always had my own workshop of varying sort of, you know, complexities and levels and facilities, um, you know, I would do odd jobs for other people, freelancing for cash. <laughs> and, you know, and then eventually I decided that, um, you know, there, I could get enough work to actually set up my own business doing metal work. And in the 80s, especially towards the end of the 80s, um, traditional blacksmithing is it sort of dropped off quite a lot. There, you know, there, there, there didn't seem to be much sort of call for it then. Um, a lot of the historic building work was being being bodged up, shall I say? And there were people who were moving into doing that sort of work but in a much more um, sympathetic and professional, um, how can I put it, sort of standard. You know, I mean, I still come across um, work that comes in for repairs where you can see it was it was repaired maybe 30 or 40 years ago. And it was it's pretty agricultural. You know, the, the welding was pretty primitive. Um, you know, but... You know, the repair is held up, you know. And so, you know, that's where my blacksmithing sort of business started really sort of taking off. And by the time, you know, I got to 1994 and set up um, my own shop where I am now, 
you know, the whole thing has sort of progressed on to, you know, what I do now. This is now sort of, you know, um, wherever we are, 20, 26 years later. <laughs> That's my history in a, in a, a sort of very brief, brief, um, yeah, brief story. That's absolutely fascinating. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's probably a lot more to it, Shane, than you know what I've just sort of run out there. But you know, that is how how I got into what I'm doing now, and what I've been doing for these last twenty six years. So obviously, your background experiences of living on site at the mill have really influenced your current work. Do you think you can oh, pinpoint? Yeah. What made yeah. you really want to learn more about blacksmithing and get into it as a trade? Um, I suppose one of the main things was, you know, people would um, um, find me and um, ask me to make things for them. And, you know, and I landed up, um, well, I <laughs> landed up getting, um, you know, quite involved with um you know, traditional blacksmithing work going, you know, with the, with the techniques and such like going back to the late late 1700s, I would say. Um, we get involved with making a lot of, um, a lot of leaded light windows. I don't actually do the leaded light work. I have a colleague. In fact, I went to college with in the early 70s who um, I met on a, a job sort of local here quite a few years ago and um I started making making windows for him that he then glazed and we've sort of gone on from there and he gets gets work um in it comes from um a lot of um a lot of church work um as well as sort of a lot of um you know stately owned type work. So that really was my main introduction to being involved with historic building work. You know, and then eventually we sort of landed up, you know, we did a project on um, um, Hampton Court Palace. They were refurbishing a chapel there in 2009, I believe. And um, one of the companies that we were sort of associated with took on running the project there. So we landed up refurbishing their windows, (laughs) Um, which were... um, I think I dated them somewhere around about 1850, 1860... Um, yeah, um, but you know, over definitely over the last sort of ten, fifteen years, you know, I've had to do an awful lot of research to find out, you know, how things were put together, how things were made, you know, in the in the past, and um, you know, if we've got to replicate things, you know, do we do them in exactly the same way as they would have done? you know, in in that era, or do we use modern techniques? And so I use a sort of a mixture between, you know, the modern techniques and some of the the older traditional ones. You know, I still do fire welding, you know, which um, some people wouldn't have a clue what to do. Um, You know, I still work in raw iron. Um, You know, I keep a bit of of stock that has come from scrap jobs, um, you know, I might occasionally have to buy some in. You know, it's not um, it's not unknown. <laughs> you know, especially where the specification, you know, from architects and conservation officers, sort of, you know, insist upon it. So, what would you say your biggest challenge has been um, in terms of storing a historical building? Managing other people's expectations. <laughs> that is always a challenge. <laughs> the work, well, the work just gets done. <laughs> you know, if there's a problem, you know, I mean, after all these years of, of, of metal working, you know, if I can't solve a problem, you know, and I can't find anyone who I can talk to who gives me a hint or, you know, I can go on a YouTube or, you know, um, you know, um, I've never, I've never failed to produce what someone's, you know, asked for, as long as it's realistic, <laughs> as long as it can be done, <laughs> you know, we find ways of doing it.
And when you're researching these historical buildings, do you get a sense of connection to the traditions of blacksmithing? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, um, I did a course at um, West Dean College um, ooh, quite a few years ago now. And um, I'm just trying to think, I'm just trying to think of the chap who, who ran it. Oh, I can't think of his name. It'll come to me. Um, yeah, he, he was, um, you know, he was a hands-on engineer. Um, and he had some, he had some wonderful projects that he got involved with, you know, and listening to him talk about um, some of those projects, you know, you could tell that he really connected with them. And I identified with that straight away. Um yeah, you know, when you when you have something on the bench that someone put together, you know, 150, 200 years ago, and you sort of look at it and you think, oh, how was that done there then? <laughs> you know, and you think, yeah, I can see that hammer mark. I can see what he did there. You know, so it does. It just gives you that sort of whole connection with it. You know, and I often think, you know, what sort of workshop was the person working in? you know, when they made that, you know, how much different was it to my workshop here? You know, it probably, you know, some of it was pretty similar. You know, I mean, obviously they, they didn't have electricity. <laughs> you know, everything was, you know, hand-driven or, um, you know, in the bigger shops, of course, it was either water-driven or it was horse-driven or person-driven. You know, I mean, when Henry Maudsley started um, his engineering shop, uh, he had a lathe that he employed two Irish navvies to power. It was a big lathe, and they turned big handles and drove it. You know, I just turn the switch on and, um, you know, press the button and it comes into life. <laughs> You know, he had to make sure that his two Irish navvies, you know, were well fed, <laughs> well watered, <laughs> you know, just like a horse. That must have been hard. That must have been hard. But that's, you know, that's all they had. So that's the way they went about things. You know, and if you go back into um, specifically the armoury trade, you know, where an awful lot of these skills were developed, you know, because, um, you know, the, the military-industrial complex, you know, throughout most of, most of our history, you know, going back specifically to the Roman era, you know, I mean, their techniques were, um, you know, perfect, perfected over a very long period of time. You know, and it was those techniques which came more into the... Um, you know, the ornamental blacksmithing trade. You know, when um, Tiju was sort of doing doing his flashy work, um, you know, those techniques had been, you know, perfected in the armory trade before he started picking them up and sort of building things for, you know, royal palaces and such like. What's next then, Shane? <laughs> <laughs> so you've mentioned working in quite a few different varied areas, anything from cryogenics to aerospace engineering to agricultural jobs. Yeah, mountain sport. <laughs> Do you yeah. have a yeah. favourite project that you've worked on or a most memorable project? Oh, they're all memorable. Um, I can't really say that there's, you know, I mean, I've got a couple of lads who come and work with me sort of part time, um, you know, and and they get they get quite sort of they get quite in, enthusiastic sometimes when we have interesting work going on, you know, and you know we bounce a lot of ideas off each other, um, but, but you know once we've finished one job, you know we're on to the next one, you know it's a continual stream, so you know the memories of them sometimes get a bit hazy. You know, I mean, some of the some of the things we have to produce are, you know, they're they're repeat style work. Um, you know, we seem to land up doing a, a lot of curtain poles. <laughs> we've got a project at the moment where we've got 31 curtain poles to make for a big house down in Dorset. Um, 
don't often have to make that many for a whole house, but you know this one's come up, so off we go. So this one will be a mem- memorable one because very rarely do I have to do a whole house of current poles, especially when there's nine bedrooms and you know numerous drawing rooms and studies and kitchens and whatever. Um, yeah, I mean some of them, some of some of the memorable ones are probably more the obscure, the obscure ones, like having to build, um, build some fencing to go round an exhibit in a cellar, and the exhibit consisted of a black granite um, stand, I suppose you could call it. And in the top of it was a was a, a bed of gravel and a cast iron skull. And the sc- cast iron skull was heated by an induction coil. So they they turned the induction coil on and about six hours later this skull would start glowing red where it was hot. And this was exhibited in this cellar. This is an obscure house and it's full of artwork. Um but um, the main concern was because because they were using an induction coil, they didn't want anybody to get close to it, you know, because if they had a ring on their finger or, or a watch, you know, the ring or watch could, you know, start heating up, you know, and burn them. So, you know, someone came up with an idea of um, putting this, this these railings and a gate around this, you know, around this exhibit in the middle of this cellar. You know, and there's a set of four um, limestone pillars supporting the ceiling, and so we had we had from a reclamation yard a big pile of probably mid-Victorian wrought iron railings turn up one day, which we then had to cut about and make to fit between these pillars to stop people getting themselves burnt from this induction coil heating this cast iron skull. <laughs> That was quite a memorable one. <laughs> yeah, we landed up having to drill into these limestone pillars to set the rails for the railings in. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And of course, it was dark. We were, you know, having to wear head torches for doing most of it. <laughs> oh, this was a this was a very interesting house. Um, yeah, and it was yeah full of full of artwork, full of artwork. You walked into the main foyer, and there were two um, two Gormleys, um, you know, standing in the foyer. Um, beautiful, beautiful figures that he'd had. Um, CNC machine from white marble. Yeah, it was stunning bits of work. You know, yeah, we land up sort of you know working in some some very interesting places and. You know, and seeing things like that, that makes it memorable. Yeah, it certainly sounds like something you won't be forgetting for a very long time. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and you know, um, having, to, having to find out somehow how, how some of these old buildings are put together so you can get some fixings and walls. <laughs> you know, I mean, we were working in, 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 in one... Um, one <laughs> very very interesting house, and um, the builders had been in there, and um, we were making um, various various curtain poles to be put up in this. Um, they were sort of um, accommodation rooms, I suppose, in this big house. And the builder, uh, I said to the builder, I said, well, what, what are the walls in here then? And he said, oh, there's about three quarters of an inch of plaster, and then there's some lath, and then um, there's um, there's some brick behind it. I said, oh, all right. And so, so you know, going about an inch and a half, and we should find some brick then, should we? Yeah, 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 yeah. So we, you know, we drilled through the plaster and through the... <laughs> you know, whatever was behind it, and there was a void. <laughs> there was a void which went through to the back of the outside wall, and um, the outside wall, the back of the outside wall, was half a meter in. We had to get some fixings in it. <laughs> so that was a bit of an interesting, <laughs> bit of an interesting fixing job that was. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, we use modern techniques for that. You know, we use a lot of stainless steel um, stud, studding and, um, you know, modern resins, 
you know, we sort of delve into the, the stonemasons sort of scene when we get involved with those sort of things. And, you know, I actually sort of, you know, I work with quite a few stonemasons, you know. They're always good for, for hints and ideas, especially when it comes to the sort of, you know, how some of these buildings have been put together. That was a memorable one. <laughs> Yeah, it certainly sounds like these things are not straightforward for you. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. And, you know, I often say to the lads that we, you know, who come and work with me, I said, you know, the only reason we're doing this is because no one else wants to, because they know what it's about. But never mind, we have a few techniques and a few tricks up our sleeves to get round it, because we've learned over time. <laughs> so, yeah, a lot of the stuff, a lot of the work that... that um, I have to undertake, you know, is based on experience. That is the key to it. You know, so going on to your last question, which will be about, you know, how do you get people, you know, young people involved in this sort of this sort of style of work, then, you know, <laughs> there's only one way to do that, and they've got to be, they've got to become experienced. And really, the only way of becoming experienced in working in historic buildings is to actually work in them. And the best way of doing that is to, you know, start doing it from from a, from a building building side, not from a metal working side. You know, I mean, both the lads who work with me have, have actually come from the building trade. So, you know, I'm very privileged to have their experiences from the building trade, you know. I mean, we often have discussions, you know, where, you know, um, I say to them, I say, well, this is your field of work more than mine, you know. I can work out how to do the metal work, but, you know, you two are going to have to work out how to do the building work because, you know, that's that's your 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 experience, that's your skills, Yeah, practical experience definitely seems to be the foremost skill that you need. Um, would you yes. say there are any other sort of very underrated skills that blacksmiths need or metalsmiths? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do. I, I, I have done over the years that um, you know, young young people, young people contact me and say, you know, have I, have I got a position that I could offer them to come and learn some skills? You know, come and have a play in the workshop. And oh, you have to sort of say to them, and look, I, 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 I'm not in a position where I can take on apprentices. Um, I can give you a lot of guidance if you want to become involved with, you know, the blacksmithing, you know, engineering scene. I said, but really, really where you need to start is similar to where I started. You know, actually get a job in an engineering shop, you know, and learn some basic metalworking skills. You know, learn how to weld, learn how to, you know, go about machining things. You know, and after sort of 10 years or so of doing that, you know, you might be in a position where you can start sort of, you know, getting involved with, you know, a little bit more sort of involved from designing and, um, you know, forge work. You know, I mean, Hereford still run their, their blacksmithing courses. Um, I don't know how well... They're attended these days. I mean, I occasionally come across people who've sort of, you know, been there and, you know, done a few courses, um, you know, whether non-vocational or sort of full-time type ones. Um, you know, and some of them go on to sort of, you know, getting involved with some, some nice work. You know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not involved with, you know, the Worshipful Company. Um, I do have a colleague who's, you know, pretty pretty well connected with it. Um, you yeah, know, I sometimes consult with him. He sometimes consults with me. <laughs> you know, he's got his skills. Uh, I've got mine. You know, so we sort of, you know, we do swap stories. You know, and you know, try and sort of develop different ways of doing things. Um, you know, but I mean, he got involved with doing a lot of structural steel work um, over at Longley, you know, and, and I started sort of 
going over to him on sort of various projects. You know, he, he, they've longly estate wanted to have a giant Christmas tree. You know, this is quite a few years ago, you know. He phoned me up and he said, do you think you could do, do some CAD drawings for this Christmas tree? And I said, yeah, I should think so. So I went over there and spent a couple of days with my laptop, you know, doing CAD work for him. You know, and then after that all went through, you know, he got involved with, um, uh, and they were building a gorilla house over there, you know. And I went over there and did a load of CAD, CAD drawings for, you know, the metal work and the gorilla houses. Yeah, I mean, my, you know, I mean, again, you know, my traditional blacksmithing skills, you know, get mixed up with, with um, you know, IT stuff. You know, I do a lot of CAD drawings. Um, you know, but I mean, I, le- I, I, I learned or started learning that, you know, back in the engineering trade in the 1980s. You know, because at in, in that time, um, you know, CAD, CAD drawings, you know, became much more the norm than they were in the... Um, you know, in the 1970s or the 1960s, you know, in small shops would would have their own, you know, their own computer systems for doing CAD drawings. So, you know, and you know, when I started, you know, getting a bit more involved with computer work, you know, the first thing I learned was 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 CAD drawing. You know, and you know, I've done. 30 odd years of it now, <laughs> you know, and I do a lot of it. In fact, yesterday I spent most of the day doing CAD drawings. And the customers like it, you know, because they can see that you're working in a professional way and you're giving them a drawing, you know, that they can see, you know, what they're, what they're going to be landing up with once we've made it. I mean, sometimes I have to do 3D 3D projects, you know, where I'll do a 3D drawing so the customer can see exactly how it's going to come out. We did one last year, you know, a, a big octagonal arbor in um, in a garden of a Georgian house that is sort of fairly local to where the workshop is here. Um, the customer was a, a garden designer in the Isle of Wight, and um, she'd moved... Um, She'd come off the island and moved up here around Salisbury, and um, you know she got in contact with me, and you know we did her this big octagonal arbor, you know. And the only way she could see, you know, what we were going to make for her was to do a 3D model of it, you know, and show it to her. So that is definitely not a traditional blacksmithing skill, is it? <laughs> but you know, it's something I use to good effect here in, 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 you know, what I'm asked to do. And I know there's quite a few other people who um, I associate with who do who do the same. You know, they, they've perfected their CAD skills so that they can do a 3D model of something for a customer. Those jobs become memorable as well. <laughs> you know, so when I sort out some photographs for Shane, you know, some of these jobs will be appearing in those photographs, you know, as 3D model drawings, and then, you know, a photograph of the finished item, if that's what you'd like me to sort out for you, for this project. Yeah, that would be wonderful to see the whole process and the technical yeah. thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, because this is the way that... Um, you know, this this style of work has sort of progressed, um, you know, specifically in the last sort of 20 or 30 years. When I moved into this workshop here, um, there were, I think I said to you when we spoke originally, there were several Johns in this village and I became John the blacksmith. Well, the, <laughs> the last blacksmith who'd been down here, I mean, he'd, I think he'd left three or four years before I turned up. I think he left here about 1990. Um, and then the previous blacksmith to him, I think it left somewhere somewhere in sort of late 70s, early 80s. And the previous one to him, um, I don't know quite when he came down here, but I did meet him once. He did come over here with a, a box of bits that he had left over. I mean, he was an oldest chap in his 80s by that stage. Um, this 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 farm in particular, 
in um, 1927 um, became um, a, an early industrial estate. Um, and the local blacksmiths um, and wheelwright who were elsewhere in the village um, came round here and set up their workshops. And the uh, the old boy who sort of um, you know started it all off here uh, got involved with the building trade. So there was a plumber's shop, uh, there was a painter and decorator's shop, there was um, a coffin maker. Um, they generated their own electricity. Uh, the first building that I took on when I came down here had been originally um, a tractor service workshop because in the 1920s, you know, tractors started coming in and they started uh, <clears throat> buying and selling and servicing tractors from here. Um, and then when they started generating electricity, uh, my old workshop became the battery shed and there was an old boy in the village here. Uh, as a young man, it was his job to look after all the batteries. They were the old, um, you know, lead acid accumulators, you know, and they had a big diesel engine that, um, you know, was uh, connected up to a, um, we presume a DC generator, you know, and that charged up all the batteries. And then, you know, they had, um, they had, uh, there was an old saw bench, an old DC motor saw bench here for quite a while before the building fell down and all got sort of, you know, sent away in the skip. You know, so where I am now has been, you know, there's been, um, you know, industry taking place here for, you know, since 1927. And prior to that, you know, the, the wheel right and the other, you know, the, the village blacksmith was sort of round the corner. So I sort of, when I moved in here, you know, I moved into a, you know, um, <laughs> well, I mean, the, the the blacksmith shop I should have moved into got knocked down by one of the local farmers in his tractor one day because he couldn't quite see where he was going and he hit the corner of the building and it fell down and that was, I think that was the original blacksmith shop which was put up in 1927. <laughs> yeah, then got turned into a barn for cattle. <laughs> But blacksmithing in those days was very different. Um, a lot of it was, um, you know, just just um, agricultural work. Yeah, a lot of mending stuff, because a lot of the um, lot of the agricultural implements and such like weren't particularly well made. Um, you know, arc welding only really came in sort of general use from manufacturing point of view in the 1920s. You know, so there was a lot of stuff that was um, bolted or riveted together still, and um, they had tendency to sort of fail. So, you know, the, the blacksmiths from that era onwards, you know, up into the 1960s, um, you know, they mostly they were doing repair work, you know, because they then took on, you know, oxyacetylene welding and, um, you know, electric arc welding. which I still do. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating to see how the practice has changed over time. Um, going back to something you mentioned earlier with computer-aided design, how do you think that has changed the whole practice of general engineering and blacksmithing? When Henry Maudsley started his engineering business, and up to his death in um, 18, 1827, 1829 era, he was the first precision engineer. He was the man who everyone wanted to go and work for because he did things like one of his um, test pieces was a piece of, oh, it is my memory here, um, a piece of brass that was six foot long and two inches in diameter and he cut a 50 tpi thread down it and then he made a nut that was six inches long with the same thread on it and that thread ran up and down that piece of bar and he developed a lathe to be able to do that so in that time up to sort of 
1820 or so, um, precision engineering was actually starting properly. And then all the people who went to work for him, people like um, James Naismith, um, Joseph Whitworth, um, all those characters started perfecting the Henry Maudsley techniques for precision engineering. So then they could make things like um, um, steam engine cylinders and pistons accurately so that the efficiencies could be increased. Not only that, but the scientific instruments could be made more accurately. Um, and they were using a lot of the old sort of clockmaker skills, you know, that um, John Harrison would have used when he made his famous um, chronometer. Um, but they were doing it from the point of view where they could repeat the work. You know, I mean, the clockmakers would just do a one-off, you know, but the Henry Maudsley School of Engineering, you know, was to repeat work. And then when Joseph Whitworth started, um, you know, deciding that um, threads had to be standardized, you know, there's no point having a pile of nuts and bolts, all with different threads on them, all handmade, all individual. You know, you want to be able to go to a box of nuts and bolts, pick up any nut and bolt, and they go together. And it wasn't until sort of like the 1870s when um, you know, it was accepted that Whitworth's threads were, you know, the way to go. Um, you know, that um, precision engineering had sort of, you know, <laughs> hit a good peak. And Whitworth also, you know, having the idea of, I mean, I mean, Maudsley wanted to have a flat plane, but it was Whitworth who actually, you know, developed that technique for making a flat plane surface, you know, which is absolutely critical when you're talking about precision work. You know, so, you know, you go back into the history of precision, you know, and you're looking at that time from sort of like, you know, 18, you know, early 1800s onwards, you know, when precision started becoming an important factor, you know, and CAD work is just an extension of it. You know, I mean, my CAD drawings, you know, I do them to two decimal places of, of, of um, you know, millimetres, you know, and we work in the workshop to that. You know, I still use some of the tolerances that I would have done, you know, in production engineering and aerospace engineering, you know, and I'll take that out of a CAD drawing that I've produced, you know, prior to starting the job. So, you know, that's the way I look at it. You know, um, these techniques now, you know, you can trace them back, you know, 200 years. There's definitely a lot of rich history there. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, this is the, and this is the European history. I mean, you, know, you start looking at the American history, you know, it's quite different. Just coming back to something that you mentioned earlier about working with other craftsmen, such as filmmakers. Do you have much crossover with other trades nowadays in your work? Um, yeah, it's, it's really only sort of like the, the, the stonemasons, you know, the, 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 the yeah, um, uh, yeah, carpenters. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have a few carpenters that I sort of work with, you know, because some of these projects, you know, have a have a timber part to them. Um, you know, I mean, the, the builders, you know, occasionally have to do sort of, you know, some structural stuff, you know, because they, you know, they... I started taking some plaster off a wall and sort of looked at it and thought, oh dear, oh dear, that wall's not very good. We're going to have to tie this together, you know, and, you know, I land up having to make some tie bars, you know, to pull walls together. You know, that was a traditional blacksmithing job. <laughs> yeah. I remember when I was doing my physics O level, you know, my physics teacher, John Dyer, his name was, he had been a sergeant in the army and he was a, he was a right old character, he was. But I remember him talking about tie bars in buildings pulling walls together and the way that they used to make the wall pull together was to heat the bar up they put the bar in one wall to the other and put something on the outside you know a cross or a plate or something or another and, you know tighten the nut up then they'd heat it up in the middle then they'd cool it and shrink it 
And as it was shrinking, they'd be tightening the nut up. And they do that in several places on that bar. And I remember him telling us this story, you know, about how they'd pull two walls in a building together by heating up a bit of metal, going through it, you know, and shrinking it when it was on. I find that fascinating. I found that fascinating then. I've never had to do that because I'm not really that keen on, on taking too much heat into a house. <laughs> So I'm not too sure how they would have got on doing that in a, you know, a nice thatch, thatch cottage with some, you know, cob walls that need pulling together. But you know, that's the way they used to do it. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do get, I do get involved with a lot of, a lot of those sort of, you know, obscure, obscure jobs that. You know, some of them are sort of traditional sort of style blacksmithing work, you know, which would have been done, you know, century, over centuries, centuries of time. It is incredible <coughs> how flexible you've had to be over the years with certain types of projects. Sorry, say that again. Um, just that it's incredible how flexible you've had to be over the years with certain types of projects, finding new ways of fitting things in and working in each yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I suppose people come to me, you know, because they sort of, they've got this idea that, you know, I can solve their problem. <laughs> I, I suppose <laughs> I'm my own, my own worst enemy. <laughs> you know, I like a challenge. <laughs> you know, and I've developed this tech, this reputation for um, you know overcoming things. But you know, without all that experience, Shane, you know, I would never contemplate some of these things. You know, if I was a young person and hadn't done all these things over all this long period of time, you know, and had such wonderful mentors as well, you know, and I mean, I still, I still remember some of the things that, you know, my mentors would have said to me, you know, um, might not have been relevant at the time, you know, but maybe 30 years later, oh, I remember so-and-so talking about something like this, you know, and he did it this way, or, you know, he knew someone who'd done it another way, and you know, and, you know, <laughs> you, you you land up sort of thinking, oh, blimey, I wish my memory was a little bit better, but, you know, it seems to be just about good enough to remember some of these things, you know, without having to sort of, you know, do too much research and actually sort of remember them from experience and conversations from, you know, 20 or 30 or maybe 40 years ago. So looking ahead to the future and how blacksmithing and general engineering might be practiced in the future, how do you think people will get involved? Obviously, there's a big trend nowadays towards sustainability. Do you think that's going to drive people to blacksmithing more? Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the right to repair seems to be um, a popular concept at the moment. Um, and I, I mean, I, I, I feel as though it's, you know, it's, it's, it's an important, important aspect of this sort of work. You know, I do do a lot of repair work, um, you know, various, various things. I did a Triumph Tiger 90 oil tank repair. You know, that's probably dated a bit. 1963, <laughs> you know, you wouldn't get a new one. <laughs> you probably wouldn't get a good second-hand one, but I know how to repair them. Yeah, I mean, there's how that's going to progress into the future, you know, is, is, you know, I can see sort of for the next, definitely the next 10 years. I'm not too sure about the next 20 years. You know, I think things are going to change drastically over this period of time. You know, by the time, you know, 
I'm in my late 80s. This is going to be very different. Um, you know, climate change is going to really have a big impact on wealth, population, sustainability. Um, and I can see a certain element of what I do now is going to be important, you know, because there's still going to be some some infrastructure. There's still going to be there's still going to be you know people wanting to have a a life of some sort or another, you know, and you know, manu I can't see manufacturing carrying on at the level that it's sort of been going for the last sort of fifty years. You know, I mean, you've only got to look at the way that the steel industry, steel production industry is going at the moment. You know, I mean, that's going to, it's beginning to hit a wall. Um, the argument for coal mining and producing coke to produce steel, you know, I mean, there's no real choice. You know, you can't really produce steel without coke, you know. There's this crazy idea that you can produce steel with hydrogen, you know, but you cannot you cannot have a large quantity of hydrogen at 1500 degrees centigrade, you know, without a risk of an incredibly, incredibly explosive situation, you know. So from a practical point of view, that is not going to work. You know. <laughs> We run on, you know, we we run on the fossil fuel industry at the moment, you know, but that's gonna that's gonna come to a grind and all, <laughs> um, you know. So generational electricity is gonna be a bit interesting, you know. I mean, I'm, I was actually having a conversation with my wife last night about this issue, and I said, I did say, I said, well, you know, we didn't always have electricity, you know. Go back to Henry Maudsley, you know, when he had his first big lathe and he had his two Irish navvies who owned a big handle, <laughs> you know, and they, they drove his lathe, you know, and, you know, and people were driving machinery in that way or with water wheels or um, with horses, you know, and they did that for generations, you know. If things are going to carry on in a way where you know, it has some similarity to what we've got at the moment, what we've had in the past, you know, we're going to be going back into that sort of situation. You know, we're going to be going back into, you know, horsepower. You know, the four-legged type, not the fossil fuel horsepower. You know, so I can see all of that changing, you know, considerably. You know, how we'd run our, our lovely 21st century TIG welders you know, which rely on a three-phase power supply, I'm not too sure, <laughs> you know. But, you know, with, um, you yeah, know, going back to the water-powered systems, you know, maybe that is the way it will go, you know, because it worked. It worked, you know, superbly. You know, if you go back, if you have a look at the um, um, John Wilkinson-style, you know, Colbrookdale style of running forges, um, and, um, you know, uh, uh, foundries and such like, you know, I mean, that was all water powered, you know, and there's very little water power going on at the moment, you know, there's one mill down near Shaftesbury, there's Carn, Carn, uh, Carn Mill, Carn Mill, that's still water powered, you know, it's no good here, you know. The, the, the River Ebble would have to have some serious work done to it to actually, you know, go back to having some water-powered system for driving a generator. That's how I see the future. You know, if there still is one, you know, as we know it, or similar to as we know it. You know, I think I think Greta was right when she when she said, you know, the children of today should panic. You know, I mean, she did backtrack a little while ago, saying that she didn't mean that literally, but I think she should have meant it literally. I think we should be panicking. I think we really do need to identify, you know, how the future is really going to be, not some pie in the sky idea of 
you know, everything running on, you know, solar panels and big wind turbines and such like. You know, that's a short-term solution. And, you know, the research in nuclear fusion doesn't seem to be sort of coming up with the, you know, <laughs> the answer to all energy problems. Yeah. So, yeah, steel production, steel production is going to be a very interesting one. And I think what's going to happen is that the price of scrap steel is going to go through the roof, you know, because, you know, what's been dug out the ground and turned, you know, turned from iron oxide into various, various ferrous, ferrous metals, you know, it's relatively easy to recycle that, you know. I can see there it's going to be a lot of landfill sites <laughs> dug up for what will then be classified as precious metals. I hope that doesn't sound too bleak, Shane. <laughs> no, no, there's definitely a lot in there that I agree with. I mean, you know... Aluminium is so expensive to produce that, you know, we just constantly recycle it. Yeah. 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 But I think that covers all of my questions. Is there anything that you'd like to add or anything that you think we've missed? Oh, probably. <laughs> right, we've got time yeah, probably this. another couple of hours worth. But you know, I mean, that's that's sort of giving you, a, giving you a. I hope that's given you a sort of a basics of what the situation is with, you know, what we term as twenty first century blacksmithing and general engineering. Yeah, certainly. You know, which is what my business has been all about for these last sort of, you know, thirty years or whatever. You know, where I come from in it and how I got here. You know, I know all those people before me got here as well. You know, as you said, you know, do you ever, do you feel a connection with those people from the past? God, oh, blimey, don't I ever. Don't I ever. I mean, I'm sitting here next to my, la my, my lathe and I'm looking at the lead screw on it and I'm thinking that lead screw was developed from the lead screw that Henry Maudsley cut in 18 whatever it was. You know, that's one of its, you know, <laughs> that that one he made was its ancestor and all those other lathes in the world are exactly the same they all came from that one that he cut then so yeah I do feel that strong connection with all those all those past people you know our ancestors live with me very very much so every day. I think that's why I love doing it, really, <laughs> to tell you the truth. <laughs> you know, it's that connection with the ancestors. Yeah, I definitely feel that as a history student as well. I was going to say, you must, <laughs> yeah, 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 you can identify with that. <laughs> I've been trying to think of it, you know, I mean, I read a lot of, um, I read a lot of, um, a lot of books of, um, you know, Victorian engineers and such like, you know, I mean, I've got a bit hooked, I <laughs> scan the bookshop websites and such like to see if there's, you know, rare, rare editions sort of still being, I mean, a lot of them these days are sort of, you know, reprints, you know, they're photocopies and they're, some of them are a bit difficult to read. <laughs> you know, they weren't very well published in the first place. You know, by the time they got photocopied, you know, they got a few, you know, smudgy thumbprints on them and such. Like, you know, they do get a bit. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, there's, there's none I can recommend. You know, they're, they're, they've all been good. They've all been good. You know, the person I think who really sort of brought things to life was Fred Dibner. You know specifically in his television series. You know, I mean, he was, he was a good historian and a splendid artist, an artisan. And he popularised things. You know, I think he was one of the people who inspired a lot of the, 
a lot of people who were getting into, you know, historic building work, you know, to actually sort of, you know, look at it properly and think, oh, you know, we can do this a lot better than we have done. Yeah, that's really interesting because some of the first things I was pointed towards when I mentioned that I was researching blacksmithing were things like Man at Arms and Fortune and Fire, those big sort of competition TV shows that kind of yeah. popularized blacksmithing. Yeah, yeah, Fortune and Fire, I mean, that's a bit, yeah, it's like the game show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I mean, a lot of what they're doing is sort of based on the armory trade. You know, when they're doing all their pattern welding, so it's like you're making swords and axe heads and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, that's all armory trade stuff. That's not, you know, that's not delicate scroll and flower work like Tiju would have sort of got involved with, you know, or um, Samuel Yellen. It does seem to be the case that the big spectacular things are the things that become most widely known about. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's because those those are the ones which have become memorable. Yeah, memorable by the people who did it. <laughs> memorable by the people who paid for it. <laughs> Bloody hell, did I really spend that much on it? <laughs> we better put some gold leaf on it and make it look like it is worth it. <laughs> I mean, that's the other aspect of it, Shane. You know, is that a lot of these skills came from the ornamental goldsmith and silversmith, coppersmith work, you know, which goes back into, you know, specifically the Bronze Age. You know, I mean, there's been some, some beautiful pieces found um, in, um, um, you know, some of these archaeological digs, you know, and they were purely ornamental, you know, and those skills are, you know, I mean, those skills are really only only found today, you know, in the jeweler's trade. You know, and they've been going a lot more than, you know, they were before the Iron Age. Yeah, two of the other people I've been pointed towards, uh, um, Thomas Timberall and Ian Thackeray, and they both based a lot of their work on um, Iron Age, Bronze Age tools, and yes. the authentic yes. ways of forging those. And it's yes. absolutely fascinating to look into it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very niche market. Uh, and those people have sort of specialised in it and, um, you know, their commissions are sort of based around those sorts of those those sorts of works. They wouldn't get involved with some of the stuff that I have to do. <laughs> I suppose that's the beauty of having your own workshop is you can choose which area you want to specialise in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great. Well, I feel like I shouldn't keep you for much longer. That's all right, Shane. I've, I've really enjoyed it. <laughs> Trip down memory lane. <laughs> yeah, you marked something off in me there. <laughs> when I got your email the other day, I thought, bloody hell. I, yeah, oh, this could be interesting. Yeah, and this is some of this is going towards the history, the Chalk Valley History Society. Yeah. History Festival. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we're not yeah. Quite yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm not really involved with it, you know, but two of my customers are. You know, one of them is the sort of, you know, the big driving force behind it, you know, Lady Rothermere. You know, another one is um, over at Lord Shaftesbury's place, you know, and she's sort of involved with the organising of it. Yeah, so, you know, I'm sort of on the peripherals to it, you know, and it takes place, you know, a couple of miles up the road. Mm. That's why I thought it was important to, um, you know, put some time aside for this today. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Mm. You've been practicing for much longer than I've even been alive for, so you've know, <laughs> a lot of experience and stories. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm an old codger now, see? <laughs> I can speak from experience, can't I? <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> Still doing it. And we'll carry on until I drop dead doing it. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's ironic, you know, that um, there was an old boy who, I mean, he passed a long time ago, but, you know, I do remember him coming in here and he said, well, I remember, you know, in the courtyard round the corner there, seeing two coffins standing up against the wall, you know, they banged them out in the, banged them out in the, in the woodwork shop round there, you know, someone had died in the village, you know, and they, they, they you know, the undertakers just sort of commissioned them and make the coffins for them. 